I want to start with four questions and ask you to decide, agree, disagree, five-point scale, where do you stand on them? Number one, it's important to me that people who have hurt me acknowledge an injustice has been done to me. One to five, where, how strongly do you agree with that? Number two, uh, be honest around this one. I think I am more conscientious and moral in my relations with others compared with their treatment of me. Number three, one to five scale. When people close to me feel hurt by my actions, it's very important to me to clarify that justice is on my side. And then number four, it's very hard for me to stop thinking about injustice others have done to me. Where do you stand on that one? Now, it turns out if you answer in the four to five range on each of those, then you probably have a tendency towards what experts in this field call a victimhood mindset. I tend to perceive myself as a victim. I've wrestled with this my whole life long. It's very easy for me to think of other people having done wrong things for me. And especially in the last two or three years, that can, um, uh, that's become an even stronger battle that I wrestle with. Uh, it's real important to distinguish between victimhood and the victim mindset. There is such a thing as victimhood. In fact, everybody's the victim of something. We have all been treated unfairly. Uh, could be by nature, in our health, in our genes, uh, particularly by other people. It's also true that victimhood is distributed unequally. And there are some people who, because of race or gender or appearance or ethnicity or for whatever reason have experienced much more unfairness, much more victimhood. It's also true that those of us that tend to have more power and more privilege tend not to see or want to acknowledge victimhood because then systems might need to be changed so that justice can be done. So that's all real important. But then there is also such a thing as a victimhood mindset where I have a loss of a sense of agency. And instead of recognizing what it is that I might do, where I might be accountable, where I could take responsibility for my life, I outsource that. And then I think of myself in terms of self-pity. I was at a church service. We were at Westgate Church where Jay Kim has become the uh, new lead pastor there. And he was talking about some aspect of pastoring. I was walking out to my car afterwards and thinking about I used to do that and just feeling a sense of self-pity that I can't do that anymore. And then it struck me that what he was talking about was actually a part of being a pastor I didn't even like. There were some parts of that job that were just uh, kind of a burden for me and I would complain if I was doing them. And now I'm feeling sorry for myself because somebody's done something where I'm not able to do something I didn't even like when I used to do it. That is a mindset of victimhood. And folks who work in that area of research say there are ways in which it deteriorates our spirit, our personhood. When I live with a mindset of victimhood, I tend to ruminate over and over on ways in which I think I have been mistreated. That becomes part of my identity. It becomes important to me over and over that people validate my sense of victimhood. I want that to be acknowledged. Uh, there's also, it's really interesting, a sense of moral elitism that comes. We live in a day of what some folks actually call the victimhood Olympics because uh, often there is a story that says victims are good people and then the other kind of folks in the world are oppressors and they are bad people. And all of that stuff can deeply reinforce a sense of victimhood. And then I don't even see it. I think of somebody who ended up going into a vacation that they didn't really choose. They didn't feel a deep sense of calling for. And when they would talk about that, they would say, you know, nobody ever really advised me. Nobody ever really told me I could go a different direction. And of course, a real important question is, did you persistently, creatively seek after mentors who could play that kind of role, who could speak that way into your life? Because other people have done that. Lots of folks have. Did I do that? That brings me to Paul Turnier and his book, The Meaning of Persons, and this core statement, to live is to choose. See, a great dividing line here is, do I view my life primarily as the product of decisions other people have made or the forces of circumstances impinging on me? All of which is real, all of which is there. 
or do I focus? Do I fix my eyes on what is unseen? Do I recognize that I am a spiritual being and at the core of personhood, this is part of the connection between Paul Ternier and Dallas Willard and the New Testament, at the core is spirit, the ability to choose and to do that together with God in submission to Him. To live is to choose. To live is to choose. Where can you choose today? Where can I choose today? What possibilities lie before me? It is through the making of successive and resolute choices that a person traces out, carves out their life. And then he gives this example of a problem. A young student came to see me. He had hesitated between his mom and his fiance. He had actually given up seeing his fiance, or at least seen her only in secret, in order to appease his mother. Is that your aim in life, I asked him, to live for your mother? And Tournier writes how that one question ended up changing this young man's life because he realized, no, that is not, that would make me a victim and not a person. He goes on, uh, prolonged indecision is a poison as far as the person is concerned. It always arises from some inner conflict which one has not had the courage to resolve or become aware of. It is common among those who have been kept in a state of dependence. It can persist in life long after the death, for example, of domineering parents. Some people will tell us quite openly that they do not even know what their tastes, their beliefs, their aims in life are. As soon as they've made a decision, they're wondering if they haven't made a mistake. And, of course, we're invited to live in the peace and the grace of God where we make decisions together with Him. So is there any place in your life where prolonged indecision is becoming toxic? Maybe it's a choice at work about a task or a co-worker or in a relationship or about finances or about some activity that you would like to pursue. Turnier goes on, even the happiest life is a constant struggle to face the problem it raises, the external and internal conflicts it arouses, which are the very stuff of life itself. A struggle to be true to oneself, to assume responsibility for one's own convictions and talents. It is much easier, I read in a letter from one of my patients, to be in the position of a victim than in that of a person conscious of his responsibilities and the gifts he is endowed with. But it is the only way to inner maturity. I can feel like a victim right now of that stupid jet that's going overhead someplace. I hope you're not hearing it, but I choose to keep going and I will bear the responsibility for whatever it sounds like. Part of what this teaches is folks often confuse surrender with passivity or resignation. No, 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 no. A surrendered will is a resolute and very strong will. Surrender simply means that I submit what I happen to desire to what I deeply value and believe to be good. But that requires not an apathetic will, not an abdicating will, not a posture of victimhood, but of personhood. And then I do that together with God. Turnier talks about a woman that came to him and, and, uh, talked about how she had been going around and around in circles and his line is she said like a horse in a merry-go-round and the line that comes out is jump over the hedge then you don't have to keep going around in the merry-go-round you don't have to live in perpetual indecision jump over the hedge what's the risk you need to take What's the call that you need to pursue? It reminded me of David in Psalm 18, verse 29, where he says, With the help of my God, I run into a troop. With the help of my God, I leap over a wall, jump over the hedge. So now today, where can you live not as a victim, but as a person? You have circumstances, you have problems, you have difficult people, but I can choose. How will I spend my time today? From one moment to the next, how will I relate to this person? What will I eat? Something as simple as that. See, we exercise the ability to choose by becoming aware of it. And we don't have to make it perfect. And in fact, perfectionism here is fatal. What will I wear today? I think it's Emily Freeman who writes in her book, uh, Do the Next Right Thing. Um, about the spiritual discipline, I'd never heard of this before, of wearing better pants. 
And she talked about, she realized one day when she was looking at her clothes, there were some pants that she wore uh, in order to please other people or for whatever reason that actually were physically not comfortable. They hurt her and or they made her feel bad about her body. So throwing away those pants and just simply deciding today, I will wear better pants. I will wear pants that feel comfortable on my body and do not make me feel bad. And that actually is a bit of a spiritual discipline. So today, in what I say, how I spend my time, how I do recreation, how I rest, when I will do that, the spirit that I bring to work, the words that I speak to another person, what I do right now as I look into the camera, how I will end this, I will choose in submission to God. God, will you guide me? So often we're afraid to make the wrong choice. If I say to my friend, let's watch this movie, what if they don't like that? If I say to my family, let's go to this restaurant, what if they don't? If I make this suggestion at work, I can remember getting in the car with my wife and my kids and deciding how to drive to the freeway. And they would say, no, 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 don't take that way. That's too long. Well, you don't have to like my decision, but I get to embrace it because it's part of being a person. It is part of why God made you. It is at the core of your little kingdom, the range of your effective will. And to embrace the ability to choose, to have the courage of it, to say no and to say yes, together in the grace and power of God is why you are on this earth. So do it today. I love you. Choose wisely. See you next time. Thanks for joining us here at becomenew.me. You can join the conversation on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. If you'd like to receive the daily emails that go along with each video, let us know at becomenew.me at gmail.com. Or if you want prayer, you can text us at 855-888-0444.